15. quite recently of two men who had just been washed up on a desert island. One says to the other, first things first, we must start a literary festival. <laughs> um, there are now so many literary festivals all over England, all over the world, that I thought I'd save you the time, especially with the um, current air crisis, of giving you a one-stop literary festival in 15 minutes so you can relax for the rest of the year. Um, I'll be featuring some local authors. I, I trust they're not here. Um, uh, the first I'm going to start with, I, I suddenly realized you're all rather highbrow. I had pitched a rather lowbrow, so shuffled my papers. Um, anyway, 15 minutes, starting from now. This is the, uh, I'm going around a kind of imaginary bookshop, uh, and this is the heavy German travel writer, W.G. Sebalt, who actually, uh, he was a rather brilliant writer. Um, parodies can be a homage, and I was... Uh, uh, when he uh, died, two of the obituaries said that he had enjoyed this, so you needn't uh, be embarrassed about laughing if you feel like laughing. The sky, this is him on uh, a beachside holiday. The sky loomed over me like a bright blue package containing heavy objects about to fall on the world from a great height. Strawberry or orange, mate? said the man. I'd asked for an ice lolly, and now the salesman in the van was cross-questioning me as to my exact meaning. <laughs> A mivy, I replied. <laughs> I know that, mate, he responded curtly, but strawberry or orange? It was then that I remembered that orange is the color of the robes that adorn the corpses of women in Delhi who have died hideous deaths. <laughs> A haunting and melancholy detail I have never been able to shed from my memory when ordering a lolly. <laughs> Orange, please, I said mournfully. <laughs> the Mivy, I was later to discover, is narrated, is named after Dr. Hans Mivy of Zurich, the 18th century apothecary whose almanac de Mivy first published in Rome in 1781, the very same year that a 92-year-old woman was burnt as a witch in Bury St. Edmunds, pioneered the notion of an iced comestible wrapped around another iced comestible, the two of them placed on a stick and priced accordingly. <laughs> Yet the Mivy ice lolly has always seemed to me God-forsaken, in its bewildered iciness, an iciness brought into savage relief by the plaintive flavoring of its outer lollyhood, so that the insertion of the mivy into the mouth induces a terrifying sense of deja vu in the hapless consumer, as though mankind itself were frozen for those few minutes on a stick to be placed into the mouth of nothingness until it melts the sole memento of our existence, a few fast-fading orange drips on the chin of oblivion. <laughs> With the sun setting behind me, reminding me of a bad egg thrown haphazardly into a darkening bin, I end my first day on the sodden beach. On this very day, 397 years ago, Something unspeakably dreadful happened. <laughs> but what? I spot a congealed chip on the worn beach. Pick it up, suck on it, and struggle to remember. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we now, I'm, that's, the, that's the longest. I'm trying to squeeze in as many as possible. This is a, a little short one. We're going, still going around our imaginary bookshop, we've got to uh, Literary Diaries. This is the diary of the uh, somewhat snobbish uh, English novelist Anthony Pole, pronounced Pole. <laughs> Viol Violet and I attended pre-luncheon drinks with the Somersets at Gloucester. Then on to the Gloucesters in Somerset, uh, the Devonshires had brought Kent along. Halfway through the luncheon, the butler informed us 
that Lady Avon was at the door. Tell her to join us, said Gloucester, drawing up a chair for her. She sat down and was halfway through her main course. Medaillon de veau, pomme lyonnaise, epinard à la crème, <laughs> all perfectly eatable, entertaining us with fulsome praise for a new lemon-scented shower gel, whatever that may be, when it emerged that the butler had misheard. She was not the Lady Avon at all. <laughs> but the Avon lady. <laughs> we now uh, go rapidly uh, lowbrow. I'm sure none of you have ever read a bonk buster. This is uh, Jilly Cooper's new bonk buster set in the uh, erotic art world of London. And this, said Guy, picking up another priceless exhibit, his eyes still fixed on Amelia's full, high, incredibly springy breast, soft and yielding, yes, but also ruthlessly ambitious and thrusting, <laughs> is one of my finest pieces of handcrafted antique china. It's from the 16th century, which, of course, actually means it was made sometime in the 1700s. She's very big on research, to be clear. <laughs> Amelia noticed Lord Guy's long, long, really very long fingers clutching the priceless <laughs> Sèvres vase. How she wished they were even now unbuttoning her expensive wet-look silk blouse, which cost £375 from Prada in London's impossibly glamorous New Bond Street. <laughs> I love him, she sobbed to herself in a frenzy of despair, whilst maintaining a look of deepest composure on her face, covered as it, as it was with a layer of perfect spot-free skin. Oh, hang it, who cares about bloody China, sighed Lloyd, Lord Guy impatiently, as with a manly swing he threw the priceless Sèvres vase over his rippling, feverishly sweating left shoulder. <laughs> All I want, Amelia, you hugely successful but nonetheless strangely insecure international beauty, <laughs> is to bury myself deep inside your smouldering breasts. Amelia swooned. Mon Dieu, she gasped as she watched her breast smolder in his hugely successful hands. <laughs> At moments of passion, the hot, red, moist French blood of her mother, the impossibly glamorous but desperately unhappy Comtesse Madeleine de Villefranche, seemed to course through her tongue. At that moment, the priceless 16th century Sèvres vase shattered against the priceless 15th century Ming serving dish and both fell headlong onto a priceless 36-piece Louis XIV dinner service, smashing it into hundreds of little pieces. Whoops! Uh, and Julie Cooper likes um, puns. Don't Ming us, we'll Ming you, said Lord Guy, bringing out his impossibly long and hugely successful manhood, which glistened, which glistened like the moist nose on a healthy pedigree Labrador puppy. <laughs> Amelia clutched her sides with laughter at his brilliant pun. Serves? You jolly well right, she quipped in response, her smouldering breasts springing up and down like excited dachshunds at dinner time. <laughs> Bonjour, she added. Once again, her passionate French blood seeming to take control of her body as she raced headlong onto the field of passion. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to spin through. This is really to catch up. I was trying to do 15 and 15 minutes. Um, popular psychology is the next section. Local author Adam Phillips. Too many cooks spoil the broth, or did the broth always need to be spoiled so as to attract too many cooks. <laughs> Popular philosophy, another local author, I think, Alain de Botton. This is his book on the stating of the obvious. <laughs> to, to state the obvious, one is obliged to state the obvious. It is according to how frequent, frequently we state the obvious that we determine the frequency with which the obvious is stated. <laughs> We're on to now, we're zooming ahead, S number six, I think. Great thinkers. This is the great thinker, Pet Petronella Wyatt. <laughs> she says, I like non sequiturs, but I wish they'd follow on from what's just been said. <laughs> um, Self-help books, they, they occupy most bookshops. I mean, go to Waterstones, everything is a self-help book, 
the help book. This is by the original self-help person, Claire Rayner. Trouser pockets can be an awful hazard around the home. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Do, I beg of you, make sure that your pockets aren't drenched full of petrol before putting your trousers or slacks on in the morning. It only takes one match to light and whoosh! The next thing you know, you're faced with a desperately sad family bereavement and the additional financial burden of a new pair of trousers should the poor love survive. <laughs> this is the shortest parody I've ever written, I think, three words, by Woodrow Wyatt in his political diary. To Chatsworth, pokey. <laughs> okay, now we have uh, Harold Pinter, local author, late local author, um, with a certain uh, irascibility to his temperament. This is uh, from his Oxford book of English verse. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high, uh, vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, and I said, come on, Lady Antonia, get your coat on, I'm not standing for any more of this fucking nonsense, those fucking daffodils have got it in for us, it's free speech they can't abide. Another poem by Harold Pinter. This is a Christmas carol. While shepherds watched. While shepherds watched their flocks by night. All seated on the ground. They were bombed to smithereens. That wiped the fucking grins off their silly faces. I'll do one more, Harold Pinter. Polly, put the kettle on. 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 Look here, Polly chum. How many more fucking times do I have to tell you to put that fucking kettle on? Um, wait, how long have I got? Okay. Um, okay, we'll do... Um, Oh, yes, this is a very uh, uh, blossoming area of the bookshelf. Uh, misery Memoirs. <laughs> the, the original mi Misery Memoirist was, of course, the Irishman Frank McCourt. Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Will you look at that? Asks Dad. I look down at me plate. Oh, Jesus! He asks. Was there ever a child like him for the greed and the gluttony, the gluttony and the greed? And now the others are staring at my plate and they'd take a pitchfork to my head out of jealousy if we hadn't sold the pitchfork to Ma McGubbins to pay for the last season's hay, which they needed to feed the donkey, to pull the peat, to buy another pitchfork to replace the one they'd sold to old Ma McGubbins. How's he get to have two peas? says Malachi. Oh, Jesus, is this birthday? Dad snatches one of my peas and cuts it in half, <laughs> snatching half for himself and placing the other half in his top pocket for safekeeping alongside last year's moth. <laughs> Malachi caught the moth in his sock and Dad said he'd keep it for our St. Patrick's Day fry-up. Moths cook beautiful in batter, he said, though their wings can prove a mite chewy. It's all that flying they do. Jesus, who would be a moth in, moth in this day and age? Malachi says moths are Protestant. You've never seen a moth with a rosary. Now, have you, he says. <laughs> but Mam says they're good Catholics. And all that flitter fluttering is them making the sign of the cross to the good Lord, is it not? So I'm cutting my remaining pea into four and spreading the quarters round the plate to give an impression of quantity, when there's a swoosh from the chimney and great grandma McCourt emerges covered in soot, her false teeth close behind. <laughs> She's been out whoring again, whispers Alfie. Jesus, how can you tell? I hiss back. She's sucking on a cough drop, says Alfie. They always pay her in cough drops. <laughs> But is it not a mortal sin, I ask? 
will she not be condemning her soul to eternal damnation? Not for a cough drop, says ma'am. Maybe for a sherbet lemon or two toffees. Now shut up and eat your pea or you won't be getting your mouse tail for pudding. Thank you very much.